So the first question, again, just sort of, uh, you know, getting warmed up here. Do you remember the first time that you visited the wall? And, and can you talk a little bit about uh, how you felt? Um, yeah, the wall was, it, when, when it was conceptualized, was very controversial. Um, I, it was very controversial, <clears throat> primarily because of the uh, uh, fellow who was head, spearheading that, uh, Jan Scruggs, um, himself was controversial in a way that he, uh, in a way that Vietnam vets in general were controversial. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when they finally designed this, uh, the art committee, the other thing was that there were no veterans on that art committee. They were all from the artist community. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, uh, discussion uh, and criticism about that. <clears throat> And then later, I think they did put some people, some veterans on there. But uh, when they made the selection, Maya Lin came out with this thing. The design, which most veterans that I knew at the time uh, really did not uh, like it. And primarily because uh, from a historical sense of, of, of uh, the most memorials are um, images that pro project positiveness and, and reflect the heroism of those. If you look at memorials, all kinds, uh, dating way back, you, know, you go to Gettysburg. Uh, if you looked at the memorials at the National Cemetery statues, uh, if you look at Arlington, if you look at the Punch Bowl in Hawaii, they're all beautiful uh, in their settings and what have you. And especially with the memorials in some areas like uh, Manila, for example, the memorial to the American forces, their columns are up, uh, they are white, marble uh, or just like the, uh, the Pearl Harbor, the uh, memorial at the, at the Arizona and, and they display the, the, num the names are displayed in a manner that reflects uh, the, uh, the proudness. Whereas when you looked at the, the Vietnam veterans, the design it was totally different. It was a trench in the eyes of many people. And I have to say, I was also impacted by that. I did not like the fact that it, if you, it, it's not until you come upon it that you see it's a memorial and it's not white uh, uh, stone, marble, it's black. Uh, and, and in a way, <clears throat> It was reflecting the darkness. It was something that needed to be buried in a way, because it was, and along with the, 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 the Vietnam veteran, uh, which was uh, an issue at the time, the, the Vietnam veteran image was very controversial. Unlike other, other world uh, war one or world war two battles or wars, even Korea, the American soldier was the American uh, soldier was always the, the, the guy in the white hat. Uh, and the media uh, portrayed the Vietnam veteran in a sense uh, they, they were the guys in the black hats. Uh, they were the, the images that the media Hollywood and the media portrayed were of the guys that were drug crazed killers that had come back doing harm. And the, the war being the way it ended, uh, <clears throat> the war was very uh, uh, controversial in the fact that 
when it ended, it was considered to be a, our, our, uh, we lost the war. So that had many complications. And so to get back to your question, I think that uh, uh, when I saw the, the memorial and I spoke at the memorial at its dedication, uh, I had a, a, a it was a, a, a different sense that because when I, when, I, when I saw the job, it was completed. I spoke, I was one of the speakers, there were many. And we were seated at the, at the apex above. And there was seats and the, and, and the podium up there. But what I was looking at, at were, was a sea of Vietnam veterans and their spouses and their, or their girlfriends and their families. Now their their uh, boyfriends or girlfriends, and uh, there were many many. And what impressed me was that they also were very very interested, and had made some had come a long ways to see this memorial, even though it, it had been controversial. <clears throat> and then what impressed me was the fact that. When the speeches were over, um, and the crowd uh, could move forward to look at the wall because they had been held back uh, by the ropes, they were oh, while, while the speeches were going on and the ceremony. <clears throat> when they came back, they all came forward to look and touch. And uh, I recall that uh, they were uh, very moved. So my whole attitude, which I really wasn't uh, that much against it when I, when I was finally finished, but uh, my whole attitude uh, changed because I saw the reaction of the veterans themselves uh, when they came forward and look for the names and the objects that they left. But uh, <clears throat> I think that was most significant to me because it really demonstrated how they felt. And, <clears throat> and being fairly new at the VA and uh, at, at that time, ceremony, I was uh, acting uh, head of the VA because uh, Harry Walters had not been named. He was a fellow that uh, re actually replaced uh, Bob Nimmo who vacated that job, uh, resigned. And so I was acting uh, head of the VA. Uh -huh. <clears throat> All of that and that ceremony and what I experienced when I first came over to take the job at the VA as a deputy, <clears throat> number two at the position, uh, and what I encountered at the VA all seemed to uh, <clears throat> uh, surface the fact that uh, the Vietnam veteran was indeed different. He was uh, seen different. He felt different because of the way he was seen. And I say he, I, I'm including men and women. I'm not, it's, it's, uh, I'm not able to keep up with all the latest uh, issues regarding gender. So I, I still talk, I'll just talk to the Vietnam vet. And not only the national feeling towards Vietnam vets, but the bureaucratic attitudes towards the Vietnam vets in general, 
uh, with exceptions, of course, but in general, the Vietnam, the VA was uh, managed, basically the bureaucracy was managed by World War II veterans, uh, some Korean War veterans, but basically World War II veterans. And they basically looked down upon the Vietnam vets. So in a way, when the Vietnam vet needed help and came to the VA, uh, he felt uh, he felt he was an outsider. He was not he was not included. So this led up to several things. One was the Viet the, the Vietnam Veteran Memorial, which uh, basically pointed out uh, the the sacrifice and. I think a fellow like Jan Scruggs would, and others who are uh, with the with the Memorial Foundation, could articulate in a much uh, uh, better way. But I think that uh, the average Vietnam veteran felt himself uh, outside looking in to the system, and uh, so along with the general uh, portrayal of Vietnam vets by the media, by Hollywood, by the way they were treated, led to several things. One, of course, being the, the memorial, but two, a, the establishment of the organization, the Vietnam Veterans of America, uh, which uh, you know, you, you ask yourself uh, why, but why did they have to have a uh, separate organization? They could have joined the VFW, which many did. They could have joined the American Legion. They could have joined the uh, yeah, others, but no, it, it, it was a different time and it was a different need. And I think the Viet, that's what propelled the growth of the uh, of the Vietnam Veterans of America, and today they are are a, a significant group, along with the other uh, organizations. Uh, but in essence, <clears throat> uh, I made many trips to the Vietnam Veteran Memorial, and each time I go there, I I feel uh, closer to it, not because uh, it it signifies a it, it signifies a uh, a recognition of the contribution uh, uh, that the Vietnam veterans made in a time in our history that is. Uh, still, uh, still looked upon as a controversial, uh, as a, uh, a a period in which uh, a country will probably never agree, just like the Civil War, until our generation is gone. But uh, so, in retrospect, even though I, I, I really. I really didn't think much about this until I had that job. And the more I was involved in it, the more I, I, uh, my respect grew for Vietnam vets, not only because I, I am a Vietnam vet, I, I didn't want to uh, see myself in that manner. I didn't want to take credit for anything, but I really, learned to appreciate uh, the contribution of Vietnam vets and what the Vietnam veterans have done since then. Uh, after the war, if you look at the number of uh, Vietnam vets percentage wise that went on to take advantage of the GI Bill and further their education and, and become uh, members and 
contributors to their communities, to their society, was greater than the World War II population and greater than the Korean vet veteran uh, uh, percentage wise. And uh, so I think that uh, we've learned a lot. The country learned a lot by the way they were treated. As a result that when we got to the Gulf War, uh, the country learned to recognize the difference between Vietnam and, and, uh, and, the, and the further or successor wars. And that being that uh, in Vietnam, generally speaking, the Vietnam vet was blamed for the war. But after that, they learned to distinguish between the war and the warrior. And whether or not you politically agreed with the, the war, you did not blame the warrior. And the, the things that began back after uh, the, the Vietnam era, the, particularly the accounting of the missing uh, is something that I think has um, embedded in our policies afterwards that we don't leave anybody behind. I think as a reflection as how many we left behind perhaps, uh, not only uh, uh, dead, killed in action, but uh, missing. And then you, that extended later back to even World War II and certainly Korea. So mm, there was a lot that happened in that period uh, that reflected uh, the way things were after the Vietnam War and what has come to be today. <clears throat> so I'm, I don't know if I'm making much sense to you, but. Uh, well, I, I have to say it definitely, uh, it definitely helps that I read the book before coming into this conversation. Cause uh, you know, I, it, it really helped me. It really enhanced my conception of what it was like uh, coming home. And, and one of the things that struck me was, you know, I've heard um, there's been a lot said and a lot written about how uh, Vietnam veterans, for the most part, were treated when they got home. It hadn't occurred to me that it was so different for you, right? That there were there was a subset of Vietnam veterans who came home and were hailed as heroes. And you talk in your book about uh, about the hero status and how you wanted to use that uh, to be part of the healing. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, when you arrived at the VA, uh, you know, what are some of the ways that that, the way the bureaucracy regard, regarded Vietnam veterans, what are some of the ways that that manifested itself that you saw that, that you wanted to change? Well, there were, uh, first of all, when I, when I arrived at the VA, I had no clue as to what it was like and what it needed to change. Because up until, from the time I, I arrived back in the States in 1973, to the time I, uh, I arrived at the VA in 1982, it's almost, uh, it was nine years. And and uh, it uh, it was very very uh, revealing because I, I mean just when I went when I went with the administration, uh, it wasn't because I was politically involved. In fact, it was the opposite. I was never politically involved. I I personally met President Reagan and Nancy Reagan when he was a governor, and I met his staff. And then when he was elected 
uh, in 1980 uh, and came to Washington. I was already here. I retired from the military and coincidentally, I just happened to be um, going through a transition stage. And so it was a natural <clears throat> to, you know, join up with, with the team. And uh, so my first job was at the Peace Corps for a year and a half as a deputy of the Peace Corps. And then I was a deputy of the VA, number two. But like I said, when I, when I went there, <clears throat> I was immediately acting head of the VA. And then I was there when the secretary or, or the administrator at the time, the, like the secretary today came in and then he, he left and I again was acting until he was succeeded. Um, when I came, um, Vietnam vets were camped out in Lafayette Park. They had barricaded the front door of the VA headquarter building. And the issue was Agent Orange. And they wanted uh, help. And they weren't getting the help. And then uh, when I first came in, like I said, I found myself acting and looking around to see what needed to be done from an organizational point of view. So I called up the head of the medical department, Dr. Custis at the time, and the head of the benefits department, uh, a lady named Dorothy Starbuck, World War II veteran, and the head of the cemetery organizations uh, at the time. And we, I sat at the table and, and basically I, uh, asked who else is here from management. Uh, and then we started talking and from that point started uh, uh, staffing the positions that I needed to be an effective uh, deputy. Because my job was as a deputy was essentially the day-to-day -day operations of the VA. The head of the VA, VA would be the secretary, and that was a uh, just a, well, a secretary's job. Uh, so we started the process of uh, strategizing what we we're going to do, how we were going to handle that. So initially, the Agent Orange issue was brought. We brought it forward along with the Department of Defense and we formed a group with the defense and which led to uh, the Agent Orange research committees that uh, led to uh, a lot of medical help for the veterans plus Congress approving a, a lot of the uh, disabilities that would be directly linked to uh, Agent Orange. And so that, you know, was one thing. Same time, <clears throat> we wanted, there, there was a movement afoot to start the, uh, uh, to do something about the, the help that the Vietnam vets needed that, uh, and the care that they weren't getting from the VA uh, medical centers. And there was a, already a movement started, and then we adopted it and implemented these uh, Vietnam veteran counseling centers, the storefront operations that uh, we opened up around the country, eventually about 180 uh, around the country <clears throat> to, to be walk-in centers for people who, Vietnam vets who are having trouble. And these were manned by Vietnam vets themselves who are qualified and certified counselors to, to help these people in a system. That was a big effort. Uh, we also at the time uh, felt a need, saw a need to do something about the uh, bureaucratic way in in, in the way that the veterans claims were being handled uh, 
everything at that time, Michael, was done by paper. And we introduced uh, actually the first word processors. You couldn't go directly to the state-of-the-art computers because the people doing the work were, were all at the time still using typewriters. And so they transferred to word processors and things that we could then gradually lead to uh, electronic uh, handling of, of, of the claims, the records, what have you. I mean, you go to any, <clears throat> any VA benefit center, there'd be rooms, just veterans paper files stacked from floor to ceiling. And uh, that's the way things were handled. Everything was paper and, and the effort was recognized that we needed to start transferring, but that was not gonna be an overnight accomplishment because you had personnel that just were not. This was 1980, early 80s. And these were people that were, had grown up and served in World War II and Korea. And Vietnam vets were just now starting to get into the system. And they knew that, but uh, so we knew that we were going to have to uh, uh, just push it along. Along with that came the medical records. And that was a big thing we did. The, the doctors out there were trying to uh, take their little uh, uh, laptops that we had at the time, the elementary ones, and, and do work and on their own each, uh, there was no standard system and we fought. Uh, one thing we did is we pushed through the first um, uh, electronic system called, it was the mumps system was nomenclature of the, which basically to standardize uh, certain aspects of the hospital system, uh, the dietetics, the pharmacy, and uh, I don't recall the other the administ administrative part. Uh, uh, there was one other area <clears throat> that the system at the time could handle, but uh, over the objections of Congress and a lot of the other critics of the VA, we, the doctors wanted something. And I recall we, we, we went with what the doctors wanted and push this. It was, uh, there was just a lot of log jams and what, what to install. And, and uh, there were a lot of calls to run tests and see which system would run best. And these would take years and we didn't want to wait years. So uh, that's one of the other things that we did at the time. But, but the other thing that I, I think I take pride in is we established uh, very good relations with the veterans organizations, the Legion, the American, the American Legion, VFW, DAV at the time, with the Vietnam veterans and uh, the AMVETS uh, and other smaller ones. And uh, we, we actually, I think, worked very well with them, recognizing that, uh, uh, <clears throat> that having them recognize that we were their uh, advocates, not their enemy. Uh, and at the time and up until previous uh, times, I believe OMB was seen as the enemy in the administrations. Uh, and uh, there was always a conflict there. Of course, the, the veterans wanted more and more. And in many cases, they really deserved, they had uh, their claims for more funding here and there were uh, realistic and, uh, and necessary. So I was there for four years and then I left the government uh, to, uh, because of personal reasons. 
uh, at the time. Well, that's a lot. Financially, financially I, uh, we had a, there was a law that we couldn't double dip. So as a retired Naval officer, I had to forego my retirement pay to work at the VA. And uh, after a while, so I, you know, I, I went straight from military service to to a political position. I didn't have the luxury of, of having established a practice or with uh, with a firm or what have you, so that I could go back to it. And the VA was not a place where you there was a, a demand in the private sector for executive jobs. Uh, and so I needed to also take care of our, my family. Sure. Well, that's an enormous amount to take on uh, over the course of four years. And I would imagine that a lot of the, uh, the metrics of success take longer than four years to materialize. So, oh, oh yeah, you know, there's a, a definitely so how, a, 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 at the time, and I, I'm sure a lot of it is today, uh, we, I, I realize that in order to accomplish something in four years, you have to select two to maybe three major uh, uh, issues, major uh, programs. And, uh, uh, and that's about right. Uh, you, you just, it's hard to overextend yourself. Uh, you have to deal with the Congress and you have to deal, you have to establish support in the Congress as well as administration and many times the OPM was from a fiscal point of view was against us and and, and, and you know we we pushed I pushed for things that I thought were really necessary when I was acting one of the things that I looked at uh, Congress had established a uh, some some uh, legislation affecting construction of hospitals. And one of the things that you had to look in when you had the design, initially Congress had passed uh, this law that said 10% of all the, of the cost of the building had to go into art and architecture. And when you looked at the, at the, at the cost of that and how expensive, how much money that was into art and architecture, and I went around to a lot of the hospitals and I looked at their art and architecture projects and there were just, uh, again, these were ar architecture uh, uh, pieces of work that were uh, approved by a committee, none of which were veterans. And then when I went to the state homes and looked at, at, at a lot of their art work, uh, for example, uh, in uh, state home in uh, Wisconsin, and, and all state home. As you walk, as you go in, here's a, a statue of a doughboy. As you go in, if you go to San Antonio, there was uh, the community on their own had done a uh, uh, a statue of uh, Audie Murphy at the VA hospital, Audie Murphy Hospital in San Antonio. Well, this is what the community wanted. If I went to other places, uh, there were modern design things that uh, the director said, look, we're gonna just put that over there and, and we're, not, we're gonna sort of hide it. And I'm thinking, why, you know, why are we doing this in the first place? Well, it's the law. Uh, so I, I, I questioned that and boy, did I get I get hammered in the media by the um, artistic groups in DC uh, that I was uh, against art. Well, no, and, and I commented to one one uh, person from the media at the time, and I said, "Look, it, it, I would rather have that money to provide medicine." and service to the veteran and not have an architectural architects, uh, artistic uh, pieces in the hospitals that they don't want. And uh, 
So, but uh, that, that really didn't go anywhere. Uh, no, I, that was pretty well set, that law. Uh, <clears throat> what they did change was they did include veterans in these committees that did the selection for the architecture. And I don't know at this point now, it's been so many years, uh, how that evolved after that. Given the, the scale and scope of these initiatives that you, that you started, um, and given that, you know, the indicators of success were going to come many years down the road, long after you were gone, what indicators did you focus on while you were there? What, what did you look for, uh, to signify that you were having the effect on, on Vietnam veterans in particular, that you were trying to, that you were trying to have? Uh, well, uh, it, let, let me be say that as a deputy, of course, I worked for the, the secretary or the administrator. And Harry Walters at the time, he and I worked closely together. and We pretty much agreed. We had a, we have pretty much an agreement and everything that I pushed through and carried out. Um, and everything was done uh, with the future in mind of what would work best like the uh, electronic systems in the hospitals, uh, the concept of uh, cradle to grave to follow the veteran and have his records and everything electronically from the time he was in service to the time he was deceased, that, that all those concepts. Um, they've come a long way since then. Uh, the move for uh, uh, long-term care, outpatient care, the establishment of these uh, outpatient clinics that we started then and have expanded. And later on, I was the uh, chair of the CARES Commission that looked at the needs of the VA. This was in 2002, uh, <clears throat> 2002, 2000 starting 2001, 2002, 2003. Uh, and uh, the, with the advancement in medicine, there was also the need for increased outpatient capability. So we started looking at, at the concept of contracting to the communities uh, rather than there was more outsourcing of that concept. And uh, th there were the political battles within and, and outside the VA. But uh, those are things that we started pushing. Uh, the change in long-term care from, and this was where I, I took a lot of guidance from uh, people in the VA who were also looking to improve things for long, especially the psychiatric and the care of the, uh, the, the ad addicted people, folks, and, and how to best handle that. I wish we were able to move a lot of these initiatives along further than, I mean, it was just slow, slow in doing it. Uh, one of the, one of the advocates for the uh, uh, Vietnam counseling program was a doctor in the VA who was looked upon as um, a quack, a psychiatrist, but he was a Vietnam vet. And uh, uh, he was the one that spearheaded the outpatient uh, counseling effort for the Vietnam vets. And, uh, uh, and, and you know, to the resentment of the old established doctors. Um, listen, there was a lot of things that were, were changing uh, in the country, in the area of healthcare, mental health care, that the VA needed to follow through in an effective way. And um, they, had to, they had to go crash through a lot of attitudes. You had to knock down and, 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 and move uh, 
people's attitudes. Uh, and that took time. It took time because I, listen, I, I'll give you an example of what you're facing. Uh, President Reagan uh, had a ceremony at the White House uh, awarding, uh, it was awarding a Medal of Honor to a Vietnam veteran. And that was to Sergeant Roy ben Benavides from Texas who had uh, in Vietnam uh, had saved many uh, lives, uh, getting shot uh, with wounds and, and he, it was real heroic. He was saving others and putting them on a helicopter and getting away and, and carrying people back and forth. And he had many wounds in doing that. He didn't get recognized until President Reagan did. So Roy Benavides came to my office. My office was across the street across Lafayette Park from the White House, he and his family, and used my office to, to change into his uniform. And, uh, and then he went across. And I, the next day I told my staff, and this is when I was first arrived, or fairly close to it, about the Sergeant Benavides who had multiple uh, wounds and you could see the scars from the, the wounds on his arms and, and there he, and the comment I got from the one person was, huh, I wonder what bar fight he got those in. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, here was the head of a department. And I, I said, you know, I was just, I was speechless. I didn't, but it reflected what we were dealing with. And uh, up, to, up to my time, uh, I, when I went to the VA, I replaced Chuck Hagel, later, later Senator Hagel, who had come in with the Reagan administration, had had that job for nine months and then left. And uh, he, uh, and so he was the first Vietnam vet to have a high level job at the VA. Prior to that, there were World War II vets. And, uh, and uh, by the way, a lot of them were very pro-veteran. They were very, but the bureaucracy had, is what I'm talking about. So, uh, So anytime, you, to answer your question, anytime you uh, took, undertook an initiative, it really was looking at the future, changing the way things were doing or bringing something new, new ideas. And uh, when you talk to the young people, staffers around the hospitals, around the country, they agreed in full. They totally agreed with everything needed to be, needed to, to be improved, but it took time. Uh, I think today there's a lot that can be said for the VA. Uh, there were a lot of programs that were established and strengthened. When you look at the, uh, the uh, spinal cord injured patients, paralyzed patients and the advances that the VA made with those, uh, with the blind, uh, with uh, the uh, orthopedic, the, 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 the artificial limbs, uh, areas of that. The, I mean, the advances were just starting to come through the VA research system. Uh, and that's, that's throughout this, with the centers of excellence that we had around the country that already were being implemented when I arrived, but the advances we made, the VA, even that short period of time I thought was, uh, was great because it was not only helpful to the VA, it was helpful to the, to the, to the country at large and a lot of these things. Was there, a, was there ever a time during your four years there uh, where you had a, an encounter with a Vietnam veteran or maybe a small group of Vietnam veterans that, that 
that gave you a strong sense that you were on the right track, that you were having the impact that you wanted to have on that, on that constituency? You know, uh, Michael, it's interesting you ask me that question. <clears throat> um, uh, I, I'll have to go back to when I was first there. I first arrived at the VA and I uh, was acting and it was uh, Veterans Day. 1982, and I, um, as the acting, I went to Arlington, the ceremonies at Arlington Cemetery, and there were, uh, General Westmoreland was uh, the main speaker, uh, one of the speakers, uh, and I was there, and in the audience were a lot of Vietnam veterans in their Vietnam, you know, their their uh, fatigue jackets and and stuff, but they were there. Uh, and I, you know, I I, I spoke to them, uh, followed by Westmoreland. Casper uh, Weinberger was Secretary of Defense. And so at the at the conclusion of the ceremony, as well, I'm walking down the the steps off the stage. Uh, and I was talking to General Westmoreland and we're taught walking and I was hanging on to the handrail as I, as I walked down, Vietnam veterans had, <clears throat> a lot of them had gathered and they were all, you know, uh, talking uh, to me, <clears throat> you know, and, and thanking me and, and they were glad that I was there. And, and uh, they were patting me on the back and I had my hand on the rail and this just blew me away. I had my hand on the rail and one guy came, somebody was standing there and he actually kissed my hand. And I, I, I said, wow, and the others were patting me and good luck, congratulations and all that. And I thought, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm, you know, but I guess he was swept up by the, 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 the group, the, the crowd. And it blew me away, and I'm thinking, God, God you know, I, that's that's not what I am. I'm not a god, <laughs> but it was. I think for uh, people uh, demonstrating their emotions and appreciation for what I had done as one of them, and and I was what I was trying to do for them, and uh, uh, but so I always. I always took my job uh, uh, with uh, with that thought in mind. Uh, especially, I kept thinking about that. You know, I'm I, I'm not a god, uh, but I, I just you know I'll I would just do the best I could, and I think that doing that is what also uh, led to this mutual respect between myself and the veterans groups. The organizations. Uh, when I first went there, when I first went to take the job, uh, White House personnel asked me to come up and meet some people. And I walked into the room and they had, uh, the White House had already uh, put out my name. But before they put out my name as the one that was nominated for that job, it was done very quickly. Chuck Hagel left and they wanted me there right away before. Uh, there was a lot of uh, people, uh, a lot of uh, effort to put other people there. And uh, I walked into this room and here's Emilio um, uh, Cryer, head of the American, uh, executive director of the American Legion uh, Gabby Hartnett, head of the Disabled American Veterans, and uh, Cooper, uh, I forget his first name now, head of the Vet Veteran Foreign Wars, not the commander, the executive directors. These were the powerhouses. And they're sitting there looking at me, all World War II veterans. And uh, we talked for a bit. Uh, and they, uh, 
they couldn't criticize me, but their comments were, you know, well, we'll see how you do. And I didn't realize who they were. I mean, I knew who they, uh, who, uh, when they were introduced, but I didn't realize the power structure. And so when they said, well, we'll see how you do. Uh, a year, a year and a half later, I was embraced by them. And so I knew I was just by just trying to do what was right and the best I could. And because of my reputation, my name is a POW, that really expanded further. And enabled my name just uh, expanded further. Um, so, um, I, I look back, I look back in those, at that period of time working with that, and I have to say that that was probably one of the uh, better times at the VA, because Harry and I worked well together. And by the way, the reason Chuck Hagel left is he didn't, could not stand Bob Nimmo. And Bob Nimmo left and Chuck Hagel left. So we, Harry and I worked well together and we worked well with the veterans groups and we worked, uh, we had our friends in Congress. And these were the fellows that were World War II veterans, both sides of the aisle. One of my strongest supporters, one of my strongest, two of my strongest supporters. And I had, I had a, 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 quite a few in Congress. Uh, Sonny Montgomery uh, from Mississippi, uh, head of the Veterans uh, House. Uh, he was a Democrat but very supportive. And then Senator Al Simpson, Wyoming. Uh, he was a Democrat. I mean, he was a Republican, but they looked after me. Uh, they, when I go up on the hill, talk, every, they, is everything okay? How you doing? You need help? You know, uh, they were advocates for veterans. In fact, when I first went to meet uh, Al Simpson, I recall, because as a new person, you had to go meet people of the committees up on, up on the hill. And uh, I walked, I, I met Al and we sat down and he looked at me and he knew my record as uh, I had uh, as a POW in, in Vietnam and, and then with the Reagan administration the first year and a half with my, uh, at the Peace Corps, and then now at the VA. And he looked at me and he says, Everett, with all that you've gone through in your life, why would you want a job like that? It's terrible, he'd say, <laughs> it's terrible. He'd say, you know, he, he said, I don't, uh, I don't worry about my job. I got more cows than I have people, but if, my constituents don't vote me out, they vote me out, you know. I, you know, and so I took that as, you know, my life did not depend on being the deputy or the head of the VA. I had other things I could do, but this was a chance to do something. And uh, so. You know, it's, it's uh, the thing that impresses me about hearing you tell your story and, and reading about it in your book. Um, you know, you talk a lot about being, uh, you know, not not being a, a political animal. And I think that the, the relationships that you were able to build and the trust that you were able to earn uh, followed in large part from people realizing that your you know, North Star, for lack of a better word, was, uh, you know, miles above politics. And, and that leads me to my, my next question, which is, you know, this book, Code of Conduct, is about the military code of conduct, and how that code helped you uh, in your life after the war. But what I take from the book 
is that before you ever got in the military, uh, you had a very strong personal code. And I think people, people recognize that in you. And I'm curious, um, how much of that code do you feel like came from your, uh, your education, uh, your Jesuit education? Um, and in what ways did that education inform, uh, your approach to your life? I think my Jesuit, Jesuit education had a lot to do with it. Uh, it formalized in a way many things I, I, I inherited growing up and, uh, I grew up, uh, you know, we, uh, we were poor, but we didn't know it. And uh, work was something we, it, the work, developing a work ethic was uh, important. I was taught that at a very early age. <clears throat> uh, I recognized that if I was ever going to do the, anything in life, education would be important. My dad, my mother in, instilled that in me. Uh, they never had the chance for an education, formal education. And, uh, and as I proceeded along, I, I recognized that uh, I always had these menial tasks, menial jobs uh, that, I mean, I was, I remember one year I was working as a labor construction and uh, we were constructing, uh, it was a, a, a highway, road building. And the crew that I was a member, uh, one of the crew and the crews were a lot of men and they would look at me and they'd say, you know, they're digging ditches and they're hammering away and working hard. And they'd look at, these fellows would look at me and, and I was in college, summer, first couple of years of summers. And they'd say, what, what's up? young kid like you uh, out here working hard, you know, working here like this, you, you know, you're, you're so young. Uh, but I was doing that because I knew I had to get money to, for school, for schooling. And, and so I always knew that if I was going to do, I recognize with all these jobs I had that I said, there's something I will never, never wanted to do anything like that again. And that happened from one job to working in the canneries uh, in San Jose at all night shifts. And uh, I said, you know, this is good money, but I never wanted, wanted to, to do anything again. And at that time, before Silicon Valley developed, there were a few uh, companies like IBM. And I would visit uh, we, we, from in school as an engineer student, I would visit uh, the plant and I'd see these guys walking around with their suits and I'd say, that's the way to go. And uh, so, <clears throat> and the only way to, to achieve it was that I also had a sense of, of patriotic duty and that's why I joined, I volunteered to join the Navy upon my, my, my graduation. So when you talk about the values and still all, oh, Santa Clara, the Jesuits did bring everything together in a way. And I said, and I really value that because when I was shot down and by myself, I, I, only, I only had myself to depend on because uh, I had no idea. I mean, I thought they were gonna kill me. They could walk in and, and kill me. And so, but I had to survive in this situation. And I found that I, you, know, you take all this thing. Today, I would say it's character, but you take all these values <clears throat> that you were taught and, and, you, and they put it together. And I remember I, I would stop at mass, quick mass in the mornings at Santa Clara. And, and uh, that you know, followed from being an altar boy, Father Buckley, had, when I was Joe Cap and I were a couple of, uh, we were the youngest altar boys and all of that training just sort of just melded into who I was, and, and that's what helped me develop, helped me sustain uh, my day-to-day uh, -day survival. I had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, I had to be optimistic. Uh, I had to depend on my, myself, my, my intellect, on how to handle it. Uh, I was uh, alone. 
uh, and I was against this whole nation of. They were. They were uh, the, it was. It was a. It was just a different existence, and I was at their mercy. So you know, I. I re finally realized that they could just. I could just. <clears throat> go die like that. But if I did, I wanted to go out. Uh, still with my what I felt were important. Uh, and that's my integrity and my, uh, my dignity. So. Well, that, uh, I wonder how, I mean. That, that's how I carried, that's what I've, uh, that's been my guiding principles my whole life. Right. I was, yeah, that was where I was trying to go was, you know, that it seems like that yeah. the development of that, in you uh, really carried you through not only your time as a POW, but sure. you know some of those hard days at the VA when it was hard to get things done because it was well, slow it, and there were politics and um, yeah, they, it was uh, it was interesting. Yeah, it was interesting, and but not only applied to that, they applied to family, they applied to uh, building a company afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, these are just things that you you face every day in one form or another and uh, uh, you never um, you, you just uh, I don't think about it it's just inherent in me uh, when I uh, I look at the situations I follow the politics today uh, I just uh, I don't overreact. Uh, so it's, it's just uh, recognizing we're going through some turbulent, changing times. And so we'll see how this goes. But I think that as a country, we're strong. Uh, we're strong uh, with our basic values. Uh, the American people, I think, are have always been resilient and strong. And uh, we'll have our flare-ups. We always have, uh, but that's what we're all about. Yeah. Well, I have taken more of your time than you uh, agreed to give me. Um, if you'll permit me, I do have one last question and this one's not for the podcast. This one's just for me. Um, but, but, but is your camera on? <laughs> <laughs> it is, but uh, um, I can stop the recording. Um, no. Yeah. So my, my question is, um, you know, one of the things that, that really struck me uh, about reading your book was, you know, you had, you had this demanding schedule as a, as a, you know, something of a celebrity, right? Uh, a war hero. You had two incredibly demanding jobs, first at the Peace Corps and then at the VA. And during that time, you were also, uh, you know, building a family. And in the middle of all of that, which seems just overwhelming to me uh, by itself, you managed to finish law school. So <laughs> my question is, how in the world did you manage to balance all of those things? Because I cannot imagine having the job that you had running the day-to-day -day operations of the VA, having a, a, a young growing family at home, uh, having a, a demanding speaking schedule. Um, and at the same time, I mean, law school is no picnic. Like how in the world, it's not like you, it's not like you went to, 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 you know, night school. I mean, how did you do it? Uh, well, first of all, I was, I was, uh, God was looking out for me. I met when I came home and married a wonderful woman. And she's the reason why I was able to do all that. Not only was she supportive, she, uh, she, she, you know, every, I mean, she was there to help and tell the talk, work with the kids. Uh, you know, my schedule was such, she understood that she supported me 100%. Uh, 
And so we did it together. Uh, I always felt, well, first of all, I had a job in the Navy before I, I retired from the Navy. Last couple of years, I was, uh, uh, I was doing my job and it involved working with the uh, defense industry contractors, the McDonnell Douglas, the Hughes Electronic, the, uh, uh, the weapon systems and what have you. And I was working as a, a, a desk in Washington. Uh, it, it was involving a lot of engineering. I was the liaison between the Navy and the defense contractors for that particular system at the time, but they was at the A4s and and I always had when I met on with them, I had a bunch of engineers, but I also had a contracting to to, to look at the law and the procurement aspects and all that. And that was new to me. I had a I had a chief, I had obtained a master's degree in uh, operations analysis, what have you, but this is federal procurement. And it was like talking Greek and I, I didn't know what they were talking about. So I started going to law school at night with the purpose of trying to understand what it was, and, and what, they, what, what it was all about. And so I, I uh, <clears throat> you know, you take the basic courses to start contract law, uh, torts, uh, and so forth. And it wasn't until the second year I started getting into uh, federal government contract and federal procurement as, as part of the curriculum. And it's a specialized area in law and it's applicable to federal government law, dealing with it, especially with the procurement Law and, and the federal acquisition regulations and the DFARS, the Federal Department of Defense and all this and that. And I started, okay. So I started piecing it together. I said, you know, this would be something I really would like to pursue after, you know, in life. But then I got involved into the political appointment and, uh, and, and but with, again, with the help of my wife, she would pack me two lunches uh, I would go to work at, at my regular Navy job, a desk job from seven, and then at 3.30 people would uh, leave and I would have lunch. And then, uh, and then people would leave it. So at, from, uh, from 3.30 to five, I think my first class started at 5.30 or six at uh, GW, which is across the river. And so I would, break out my law books and eat my dinner, the second lunch, and then zip across there to, to class. And then I would have class till, uh, most nights till uh, two classes from one and then the other. And I, I, I would get out at 10 o'clock, get home by 10.30, and then uh, uh, hit the books for a couple of hours and then, and then, you know, do it five nights a week. And I, I, you know, I said, I'll try it. And if it works, it works. Well, it, it worked for the first semester. Then I said the second semester and pretty soon I had a year. And then when I graduated, I had two years. When I, when I retired, I'm sorry, I had two years under my belt and I needed two more. And so I kept going as time would allow or as a schedule. And, uh, you know, many times I had to travel uh, with these jobs, I was I would travel with my law books and, and read on the plane, basically, and do do, do that. But uh, you no, know, my wife had a had a tremendous part, and I was lucky that I I had that support. Now she's my boss. We've been married 47, 47 years, and uh, I finally succumbed. I thought, you know, with all these degrees and work, I, I would be king, but no, no, she's, she's the boss. I, I, I graciously gave up uh, trying to rule a roost here at home and, and what have you. Uh, that's, that's one thing I learned. I learned how to get along <laughs> with her. <laughs> yeah, yep, she's always, she's the boss. She must be amazing. 
Well, yeah. I can't thank you enough for spending this time uh, with me. And I, I, um, you know, and I'm just so profoundly grateful um, for your example, you know, your life of service, um, you know, which continued. I know we focused a lot on your time at the VA today, but I know that there have been, you know, decades since you left the VA that are that are just as compelling and just as exemplary. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm awed by your example and inspired by it. So thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Michael. And, and uh, you know what? You've uh, uh, reminded me by uh, this. And it's been a while since I've been at the Vietnam Veteran Memorial. And, and I need to get down there. Once they open up the city, uh, and, and, uh, I, I really, we don't go down there anymore, but I need to, need to go then every once in a while, I used to go down and, and look at the wall when I was at, uh, at the VA or at the, going to law school at night and come back and, uh, it's just as compelling at night as it is early morning or what have you. And, and, uh, some of these names, I, 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 my friends, some of my friends are on there. Well, I hope to see you there sometime. Look forward to it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much.